as I said, is being hosted by the Yavapai County Master Gardeners. We're part of the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension. Now, every county in Arizona has a cooperative extension, and you may be familiar with some of our other programs. We have things like 4-H, food safety, nutrition education, STEM and commercial horticulture and small acreage support. The Master Gardeners provide the science-based horticulture information, and tonight's presentation is on landscaping with native plants. Now, our speaker is Leslie Allward, and she's awesome. Um, she's spoken to us before, and we love having her. She's a very popular speaker. Um, Leslie learned a real love of plants from her mother as a child, and as an adult, she found she had a knack for design. She became a landscape contractor, designing and building residential gardens, specializing in accessible gardens for those with mobility challenges, like you know who. And um, when she moved to Prescott, she leapt at the chance to learn gardening about gardening locally and completed the Master Gardener cert Certification in 2005, which means she's emeritus. She's a vegetable grower, landscape contractor. She created a garden consultation business and now offers gardening talks through the Master Gardener Speaker Bureau. And as a Master Gardener, she volunteers to design and build native plant and pollinator gardens and schoolyard habitat, gar habitat gardens for the Highland Center Natural History. Welcome, Leslie, take it away. Thank, thanks so much, Tricia, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm excited to be able to be here and share a bit of my knowledge. I have a great deal of experience, but there's no doctor or ist. You know, I'm not a horticulturalist. Um, I have taken many classes. I'm a lifelong learner, and so I've learned as much as I can in my years here. And I've been gardening in Prescott since 2003 uh, and otherwise since the early 90s. At any rate, um, so let's get going. Okay, so native plants, we're going to talk mostly about low water or drought tolerant native plants and the guests that they attract. So I am, hey Tricia, how can I get rid of the the face is on the right side so I can get, have my whole screen. Do you know? Tricia? Oh, well. Here, wait, there. Never mind, got it. Okay, so uh, this is a bit of my uh, native garden uh, up near my home where I have pr principally native things that have self sown, come together in a community in the way that they like it. Uh, I have a actual butterfly garden because I learned that a very invasive weed that I thought I had was actually horsetail milkweed. And so I began to just add flowering things, nectar rich things, pollen rich things in order to encourage as many butterflies as I can. And I've had many monarchs, though not this year. Keep moving. Okay, so go native. Why do we want to do this? Number one, I feel that we are all mm, responsible for being wise stewards of the land and water is our gold here. So principally it's for uh, low water plants. I also do grow vegetables within my native garden. And so I want to bring in as many pollinators as possible uh, for my successful vegetable gardening. And while there are many varieties of plants which will bring pollinators to your garden, there are very compelling reasons to go and grow native. So let's figure out what native really means. Here is a short uh, definition that I discovered. Plants that occur naturally in a particular region, ecosystem, or habitat without direct or indirect human intervention. Hmm, I'm not certain that that's even possible in our world. However, um, we find that the concept of regional adaptation, climate is changing, tourism brings new plants in and out. So things are changing constantly in our environment. 
but uh, we'll think of regionally adapted plants as native. And because native is easier to say, I'm gonna go ahead and use that verbiage. So these are the reasons that really wanna, we wanna really consider using native plants in our home gardens. Number one, they're adapted to our local climate. They are adapted to our native soils. They have co-evolved with the soils in our area. The most exciting is that they support biological diversity and they do provide habitat. We won't talk really about the fact that they're beautiful and low maintenance, but you will find that during the course of this talk. So we'll go into a little more depth on number one through three here. So they are adapted to our local climate. They tolerate their wide ranges of temperatures and periodic drought. Thankfully, we're a little bit out of that drought for the time being, and we're all very grateful. Uh, they're typically more drought tolerant and require less water than non-natives do. Let's look a little further at our uh, climate. These are just very general graphics, but our average temperatures in general can vary as much as 30, perhaps 35 degrees each day from morning low to afternoon high. That's not the norm in many places. Additionally, our precipitation is principally in the winter and the summer with drought during the spring and fall. And of course, what's happening in the spring? Plants are beginning to grow. So if we introduce plants that are used to spring showers and such, then they are going to struggle with our, uh, with our uh, climactic uh, situation. We always think of cold as being the limiting factor in plant selection. So there is a USDA DA plant hardiness map. This is it, it is online, it's completely interactive and you can zoom into our area in Arizona. It was too blurry for me to use, so I'm just giving you this information. You don't have to use that URL, just put in USDA plant hardiness map and it will come up. There is another one that I discovered that shows Arizona more uh, in more detail. And here I've put up the Quad Cities and pretty much from a zone and USDA zone, this is separate than the Western, the sunset zones. Uh, this is a little more accurate. They go by the low temperature zero to five for 7A, 7B, 8A and 8B pretty much cover our entire Quad Cities and Yavapai County area. Um, there are, however, microclimates at everyone's, in everyone's uh, property, as well as in different communities through, uh, through our area. There are some areas in the forests that are much warmer than I am closer out into Williamson Valley. So these microclimates you need to take into account when you are selecting your plants. Also, when we talk about microclimates are affected by topography. So for instance, a south facing slope is the hottest possible slope. Even though the Western sun is the hottest, it's if, if the topography is sloping to the south, then that means that the angle of the sun is hitting it almost perpendicular. And that is a really, really hot and dry aspect. Okay, so when we talk about topography and aspect, it's slope. And then of course there's shade factors, shade related to your home. So the garden space on the north side of your home is gonna vary greatly from on the west, east or south. So you need to be aware of that. Additionally, if there are large trees, they will also provide shade. And one of the real challenges in designing and building a new garden is if you want to put, like I'm going to have a number of columbine under a beautiful uh, desert willow. Well, the problem is the desert willow will be, have a canopy of about three feet and these columbine will be subject to strong sun until that canopy grows. And so sometimes you're forced to actually hold off on planting things that will be in shade 
until a later time when there is actually shade. So you might design it, but you may not be able to install it. Okay, let's go back to words, 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 words. These water, these five different words, low water, water wise, xeric, drought tolerant and drought resistant are used fairly interchangeably. And the truth is there's lots of different uh, differences rather in these, in these words. Low water plants, moving along, they need no little or moderate supplemental irrigation once established. And that is a concept that is a difficult one to get a handle on. What does once established even mean? Typically we say three years of appropriate watering to develop a significant root system to be able to survive with less additional supplemental irrigation. Well, if we take away July of this year in the last two years, we would have had to add a great deal of water to everything. In fact, for those who have not been giving additional water to their big trees, their native trees, you may have uh, had some mortality in those trees because we had so little winter and uh, monsoon rain through a two year period. So once established is dependent upon many, many variables. Uh, for the Prescott AMA, which is the active management area, it means a maximum of 12 inches of supplemental irrigation annually. And just for your information, a little bit over a half gallon of water is equivalent to an inch of rain on one square foot of soil. Gives you a little bit of an idea. So Zurich is actually a term that was, that was coined by a specific body to talk about plants that evolved with drought and can function completely in dry conditions. But let me make a note about this. If you're driving from Prescott to Phoenix and you're out in the area near Sunset Point uh, and you look out across the, the plains there, uh, yes, those plants are absolutely xeric. They have, a seed has been dropped, they have grown in the absence of any additional water. However, where do we get our plants that we choose to plant in a garden, they come from a nursery, and they certainly have not experienced xeric or low water lifetime, life during their lifetime. Um, they have been watered regularly. They have nice soil. Indeed, they have soil. So we have to treat those plants that we transplant, at, that we've purchased, differently than the idea of a xeric. When things self-sow and they start from a seed and you haven't given them any additional irrigation, you can term them xeric. Drought tolerant and drought resistance basically are uh, survival mechanisms which plants have established through time. They defoliate if they don't have enough water or they go dormant and simply cease growing. Uh, but then when moisture comes, they resume their normal lifestyle. Oak trees are a perfect example of drought tolerant. Oaks typically look pretty gray, brownish early in the spring and until we start getting monsoon moisture because they are actually deciduous. They just don't lose their old leaves until new leaves, new leaves push them out and they will not put new leaves on until there is enough water to support them. So nature is pretty amazing. And so, yes, the tag on your plant in the nursery will tell you if they say it's low water or drought tolerant or xeric, but I think that you should know what they look and feel like without having to read something. So number one, they typically have fine, lacy foliage or very small leaves. Of course, the reduced leaf surface reduces the water loss from transpiration. They also might have thick succulent and waxy leaves, which naturally trap the moisture and, and actually have reservoirs in which to hold the moistures. 
They have resinous coating on the leaves, which, which retards water loss. So the, your coniferous uh, evergreens, have the, all of their leaves are resinous and it helps in that regard. They have hairy or fuzzy leaves to trap the moisture. A favorite of many people is blanket flower, Gallardia. They indeed have quite fuzzy leaves to hold on the, to the moisture. Gray foliage plants as a rule are very low water, uh, lowest water of most, and they really never prefer overhead water. And they're those with deep, deep extensive root systems. Ponderosa pines are perfect examples of this. Their, they, their tap roots might go down 30 feet or more, but their lateral roots closer to the surface might extend out 100 feet in all directions. They're quite amazing. So let's look at these, some of these different categories a little bit. Succulent or succulents. They have fleshy leaves or stems that store the water. They have the waxy coatings on their leaves, or, and this includes all cacti, agaves, yuccas, and others. So the agave perii that you're looking at, I love uh, the, this particular plant. It's, it is quite uh, cold hardy. It's very architectural, very stunning. It's a, it's a plant that looks good year round. And so for that architectural reason, it, it is well used in the landscape. If you don't have a fenced area, be a little bit cautious because the javelina will eat the fronds in order to get water out of them. These little call outs that you see, deer resistant attracts hummingbirds, et cetera. Those are from High Country Gardens. It's a website that uh, and an online seller. I'm not saying you should or should not uh, purchase from them, but they have these little uh, call outs, which make it really easy to, to figure out, hey, I want to look at deer resistant things. And so it's very easy to find this. So High Country Gardens has a wealth of information about uh, uh, plants which are hardy in mountainous zones, in the western mountainous zones. The yucca baccata is unique because it can take afternoon shade. Not very many succulents enjoy shade really at all. Cacti, uh, they have scales or spines instead of leaves. Those stems are photosynthetic, so that's how they get their energy. And these thick hardwalled stems, they can be spongy or hollow and they store water. If you've ever been down to the botanical garden down in Phoenix, they'll talk about the, um, oh my golly, the large multi-armed cacti, and they'll expand to twice or three times their shrunken size and be able to hold approximately, you know, hundreds of gallons of water. It's quite amazing. Small leaf plants include things like our mountain mahogany, the Apache plume, blue flax, linum lewisii, and many, many native grasses. This is a picture of side oats gramma grass, which is a great source of seeds for finches and other birds in, in your yard. You don't always have to buy seed to bring birds into your garden. The Arizona cypress is a good example of a, a conifer that has resinous leaves. Now, unfortunately, there's been a great deal of mortality in the cypress of late. I have to admit, I lost a few because I did not water them sufficiently. I'm on city water and I have a couple acres and I was picking and choosing, but I actually did lose some of my cypress to this past drought. Drought avoidance is another uh, technique that nature uses, basically through being an annual. And they do everything from go set, going to seed to growth to flowering to death in one year's time. And if there isn't sufficient moisture to start the growth cycle, then the seed simply stays put. Um, these are a number of, of uh, native annuals. The Gallardia pulchella is a typically it's a very it's a tall 
Gallardia with a single flower or maybe two, whereas the hybrids that we have, uh, of course, are, have many, many more blossoms. The uh, Mexican poppy is native to our area, but the California poppy thrives here additionally. The tansy leaf tansy asters everywhere as a wildflower. Prairie cone flowers, um, you may not have them in your neighborhood, but they naturalize very well here. Uh, and, and the common sunflower is a wonderful habitat plant, brings its, uh, the pollen and nectar, is a, it's a very rich in that regard. And, and the lupin, lupin is actually a perennial, but it is a short lived perennial. So not only are the plants adapted to our climate, but they're adopted, adapted to our native soils. So they don't require amendments to correct for our alkalinity. I put the words that are in color, uh, different color, you know, amendment is something that you incorporate into the soil. A mulch is something that which goes on the surface. So that should be clarified because you don't want to be mixing unaged or composted things into the soil. Uh, if, if you're going to plant soon. So amendments are typically well composted. Alkalinity as opposed to acidity. Our soil is highly alkaline here. Uh, and uh, native plants don't, do not require fertilizers. Not only that, you don't want to fertilize them even a little bit, and we'll go into why. So this is our soil. So first of all, I'm assuming we have soil or you have soil. Many areas over Sedona, there's, there's no soil, uh, in which case everything has to be brought in and you do, need to do raised beds. If you do that, try and get a soil that is not rich in nitrogen. Most uh, soil blends do have some nitrogen in them, but try and minimize that or get a topsoil and mix in a a uh, carbon rich uh, compost rather than nitrogen rich. At any rate, our soils, if you have them, are quite alkaline. And as you move to the right on this chart, it becomes more alkaline. If you're at eight or 8.5, then the major things, and we're, we can look at the top three, which are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but indeed, indeed the next three are also quite important as are most of these. MA is moderately available, SA slightly available. So phosphorus, which is responsible for what? Root and flower development, kind of critical, is only slightly available in our soils. And that's a real problem. Jeff Schlau has, has in his backyard gardener, uh, articles gone into depth about how to try and maximize the use, the uptake of phosphorus. So check it out, Google Backyard Gardener. It's a weekly column he's written for decades now and he's indexed it nicely. Uh, so phosphorus is slightly available. Potassium is marginally available. It's not as critical to our growth as phosphorus. Nitrogen gets used up rapidly though because of the heat and because of the growth of plants so you need to continue to add nitrogen in a way that isn't going to overtax the native plants you can do this by putting uh, a well composted uh, compost on the surface so that when there's rain or any overhead watering, basically it leaches slightly into the soil to give a little bit more uh, growth opportunity. But the neat things about native plants is they have this symbiotic relationship with the organisms in the soil. If you and so that basically through photosynthesis, they bring in food down into their root systems which then the fungi and the mycorrhizal fungi and bacteria are able to use because they are in the vicinity and or attached to the roots. So they are able then to grow without photosynthesis 
and they in turn make nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium available to the plant roots. So the best thing to do for your plants is to improve your soil if you're not using native plants, and that will help with the entire process of growth. All right, now we're into the most interesting part, which is that native plants support biological diversity and they provide habitat. So when we talk about habitat, food sources for both the young and the mature species, shelter from predators as well as the elements, and places to nest and raise their young. And when it's the part about places to nest, then that must be materials to build nests with. So now we're going to look at a number of, of native plants. I'll tell you a little bit about them and who enjoys them um, and anything that is super special about them. The Chilopsis linearis, which is a desert willow, is actually a riparian species. However, it takes drought very well, very well. So if you have a problematic area on your property where you get uh, ponding during the monsoons and it, go ahead and plant your tree there. It's fine if it dries up, but it can take wet feet, it can, dry, it can actually grow in stream beds, but it can also take drought quite well. The shape of the flower is like a big flute, so hummingbirds love it. It's a large enough flower that butterflies also can get in there and nectar. And then the bees actually will go inside and completely disappear. So it is one of the best habitat uh, plants you can have if you're interested in bringing pollinators in. And if you look at the number of blossoms on this tree, you understand that there's a great deal of nectar to be had. It's one of my favorite trees. The red buds are, is another, if, if you've been in this area at all during the early spring, this is one of the first bloomers. It actually, they bloom along the branches and the stems. There are no uh, attachments. So they're just quite dramatic. And then when the blooms begin to fade, the, the leaves will come out. So the Western red bud, the Circus occidentalis is, reliably hardy to 7B. I had, I've had some mortality in some of the gardens that I had planted here. Uh, and so I've switched over to when I can find them, either the Mexican redbud, which is slightly hardier, believe it or not, but the Oklahoma redbud is much hardier. The, le the leaves are a little bit glossy. Well, they are glossy compared to the Western redbud and the Mexican redbud, which en enables them to uh, save some water uh, and they can go down to minus 20. And they, they have a similar form to both the Western redbud and the Mexican redbud. So they're difficult sometimes to find because people snatch them up rapidly if they're uh, in an area that is a little bit uh, chillier. So theoretically the Western can get down to zero but that has not been my experience. Now, Salvia gregii is native to Texas. It's not actually native to us, but it's certainly regionally adapted. The Furman's Red, which I've uh, taken this information again from the High Country Gardens uh, site, um, it is one of the hardiest. And when I say hardy, it means most cold hardy of the varieties. They have begun to do a lot of hybridization and uh, of salvia gregii, and there's many, many, many colors available. There's a, a grape purple one, there's a yellow one, there's a orange one. Now, as they get further away from the original, the original red and magenta are, are typically quite hardy and long growing and, and easier in terms of having a real cold snap. Some of the new cultivars are a little bit more fragile. So just be aware of it. They're beautiful and they may well do fine in your garden. One of the things about Salvia gregii, the first year you plant during the first winter, you wanna carefully put a whole bunch of mulch and actually take it from the sides, push under it and cover 
the actual crown of the plant a couple to three inches deep because the first winter sometimes uh, will kill them. Once they get through the first winter, then they're off and running and they'll live for a very long period of time. They're very drought tolerant uh, and they do continue growing outward constantly. And as branches touch the ground, they root. So you can easily follow a branch back, go beyond where it is rooted, cut it, dig that up and move it to another area quite easily or give it to friends or, or donate it to our, uh, our monsoon madness plant sale. Shrubby sanctfoil, king sinkfoil, however you, it's one that I cannot pronounce well, I apologize. Uh, but it's a, it's a kind of a neat and tidy native. It's got the daisy shaped leaves. They're smaller, but they're profuse. And the little blue butterflies, as well as uh, uh, bees will frequent this. Uh, it, as I say, it's quite a neat uh, shrub, gets about three feet tall. It does take pruning well to keep it a little more compact and more floriferous. Um, and uh, it's just a real bright and cheery plant. If you want to attract butterflies to your garden, it's wise to, to plant the rubber rabbit brush because it's a fall blooming plant. It's a large shrub covered with lots of flowers. The, the actual smallers are, the flowers are small, but there's many of them. And any, well, any butterfly that is at all hungry is going to nectar off them, but also those that are getting prepared to migrate are, will tank up on the fall blooming flowers. It is a large one, five to six feet tall, five to six feet wide. Um, if you want it to be a little tidier, it's okay to give it a late fall uh, pruning. Just give it a nice, you know, rounded form. And that way it will, won't be quite as floppy. It will get quite floppy if, uh, if you don't do some touch up with it. Desert globe mallow, or sometimes it's just referred to as desert mallow, is a native which tends to uh, run under the soil. So it will form a thicket. The flowers, the, the insert that I put there, that's quite amplified in terms of size. The flowers are about perhaps three quarters of an inch across, a half to three quarters of an inch, but there's many of them. Uh, and the bees love them. The uh, small butterflies frequent them uh, and anything that, and when I refer to bees, that also talks about wasps and, and any other uh, such in flying insect. It's very showy. And the only thing you need to re recognize, there is a, a cultivar called Lewis Hamilton, and it tends to be uh, solidly orange, but frequently in nature, some of the flowers will be become almost white to pink and even to lavender. So if you're dead set on having an orange, look for the Lewis Hamilton variety. The fern bush. This is a new, uh, I planted this a couple years in my garden. It's about four and a half feet across and about equally high. And it's just covered with bees. Absolutely, they are just in heaven. And that, that's actually a, a photo I took. Uh, the bee didn't even mind me being right there. It's a very, it you know, does look like a fern. Uh, it's very hardy very loves full sun, uh, not very much water, and it does get very tall and wide. I have, I do prune off the uh, bunches of flowers, but I've not, I'm not trying to uh, restrict its size at all, and I'm not aware if it enjoys or does not enjoy, enjoy uh, pruning. But it is resistant to deer. Again, it has those fuzzy leaves. Deer tend not to like things that are fuzzy. The fragrant sumac, which is a Rue aromatica, grow low variety, is a hardy, hardy ground cover. Gets about 18 inches high, spreads quite wide, um, and in the it is deciduous. It, and in the fall, it gets this just really vibrant color. This 
photo is probably rather late in the fall. So it'll turn absolutely bright red, reds and oranges. It can take some afternoon shade, which is nice, uh, totally low water. Uh, and the, the flowers are quite small and insignificant, but, but profuse. So that's why it does attract uh, pollinators. In terms of vines, one of the favorite is a Virginia creeper. It will cling to walls, so you don't have to support it. Um, and it is deciduous, turns gorgeous, brilliant red, and it bears the, the lots of berries. Uh, people will, I've heard, make jam out of it, but the birds look like it, I think, more than humans do. It's quite beautiful. You can also put it on if you have a hillside and just let it tumble across the hillside. And what I would do is, is stretch out the branches and actually tack them to the ground like with a uh, irrigation staple, or you can simply put a rock on top of it so that it encourages it to root. And then it will pretty much spread across a large area and it works very good for erosion control as well as being beautiful. Here's a little bit more look on succulents. Um, I'd showed you the agave perii before, but it deserved a second look. Um, the desert spoon uh, is tends not to bloom much. Uh, and so it's mostly just a very sculptural uh, gray foliated uh, sharp. The, the sides of the, each of the, the fronds have actual uh, spines on them. So you need to be a little careful, but it's quite beautiful. The red yucca is one of my favorite because it is the epitome of the hummingbird plant. When the stalks, flower stalks come out in the beginning, they are the, the color of the actual blossom. They're just a coral red, quite beautiful. And then as they go, as they get taller, then they turn to green, the actual stalks. And the number one, there's a gazillion blossoms, but they're shaped like a funnel and the hummingbirds absolutely love them. There is a, incidentally a yellow version of the Hesperalo and the, the hummingbirds do like it additionally, but if given the choice, they will go to the red one. The prickly pear cactus, if you get Engelmann's variety, is hardy here. Uh, for those of you that uh, uh, are aware, the tunas, the pre-blooms are, are um, edible and they're used for making all sorts of things in different cultures. And the claret cup hedgehog cactus is equally beautiful with its blooms. Now, both of these will be uh, will be eaten by javelina when when there's no water available because of because they hold so much water in their structure. So either just let them be or uh, be, put them in a fenced area. Otherwise, they'll be if it's a large a large prickly pear. They some of the predation is fine, but with the hedgehog cactus, there's not much to give away. Grasses are typically very drought tolerant. They're very good for erosion control because of their vi very fibrous roots, and they're just beautiful. Uh, the Budaloa gracilis, which is a blue gam gramma grass, this is a cultivar which has made it larger. It's about two feet tall and wide. Children love it because the seed heads look sort of like eyelashes, and they'll pull them off the plant and put them against their eyes. It's quite fun for the youth. And then a uh, little blue stem is on the right side. It really varies greatly in what it looks like depending upon the time of year and also just the quality of your soil. Sometimes it's definitely has more of a bluish tinge, but when it's young, it's uh, definitely greener. It's, a, it's more of a three by three size grass. And then the deer grass, the actual foliage will get a good five feet across and four foot tall with the seed heads going up three more feet. It's, it's quite a, uh, a beautiful, beautiful grass in a home setting, I'd recommend, 
going ahead and cutting it to the ground in the uh, late winter. Um, Typically herbivores would do all that for us, but of course we fenced them out in most places and or they simply don't run our neighborhoods any longer. And so if you don't cut back the dead growth, then there will be a lot of brown within, within the, the body of the grass. And that will be true of the other two that we looked at additionally. Remember you wanna get food for the young too. Native grasses are used uh, as host plants for many butterflies and things like lupin is also a host plant and also the native, um, oh gosh, native, it'll come to me. I didn't write it down. So there's many, many host plants available, but grasses are awfully good. And also the adult butterflies will nestle down into uh, between the blades of grass and in inclement weather and they'll take shelter there. So now the favorite Forbes, and I, I put a ton in here. So we're gonna go through them pretty quickly. The Blackfoot Daisy is low, tons of white blossoms. Don't kill it with kindness by overwatering. It cannot take overwatering. It's beautiful in rock gardens and up against granite boulders. Angelita Daisy, if you like, this color blossom starts blooming in April, stops when frost, when it gets, hits frost, frost in November typically. It will self sow, but it's easy to control. And it just has a constant flush of those beautiful flowers, which are held on these tiny little stems. Blanket flower, we all know of. Here I've shown the original on the left side, uh, Grandiflora. And then they've hybridized them, cultivars now that are all red and tending toward uh, the orange and even yellow. Again, I've found that the original Grandiflora is hardier than the others and more long blooming. Now these, the finches love the seed heads of these. So I play a game figuring out how much I can deadhead to encourage the blossoming and how much I need to uh, let it just go to seed. Chocolate flower, if you like chocolate in the morning when the, they open each morning, the fragrance is unmistakable. Very, very drought tolerant. They will spread uh, by self-sowing and the finches also love to munch on their seed heads. Conoclinium gregii, Greg's mist flower, which is in the foreground. And blue is a color you see depending upon the light. So it changes dramatically. So that's actually a butterfly on a conoclinum on the right. In that picture of the three of the grasses with the conoclinum in the front, in the back is Rubina bonariensis. It is not a native, but it holds its blossoms very high. That's a perfect setting for butterflies. They've got the protection from the grasses, host plants for their larva, as well as uh, lots of nectar-rich plants. Now the original yarrow, our native yarrow is white. It's very invasive. It will go anywhere and everywhere that there is water. They have made some, they've done some hybridization. The moonshine yarrow on the, the yellow one is much tidier. Uh, has that gray foliage, very drop tolerant. The, the uh, flowers work nicely for cut flowers actually. And then there's also the red velvet, which is a, according to some, an improvement on the paprika. The paprika starts out the same color red as the red velvet, but then it becomes more terracotta color before going to a brown. Whereas the red velvet evidently holds its color longer. Uh, butterflies like these, but I have so many other things that I don't find a lot of butterflies, but a lot of other small flying insects. Penstemons are the foundation of many drought tolerant gardens, and there's many, many, many. Uh, uh, Rocky Mountain is, as it says, from that area, but it's very well adapted here. They're shorter blooming, so you try and get ones that go off early spring, mid spring, late spring, early summer. And then you have that continuous 
uh, hummingbird food. The Pseudospectabilis is a, an Arizona native. Uh, Palmer's Penstemon is native to Arizona, very fragrant, not as showy in terms of the blossom color. It's more of a subdued pink, but really fragrant. The Perii is not fragrant, but really quite showy. And it's later in the winter and spring. Other hummingbird magnets include coral bells, Hrukura. This is just the original species. They've done cultivars which have different foliage color. I just like this for uh, the fact that it blooms early and the hummingbirds do find it. I have it in the same garden as the golden columbine, the golden spur columbine, which is an Arizona native. It can take a lot more sun than some of the other cultivars of columbine. It is very, they hold the flowers up about 18 inches to two feet high. It's quite quite amazing. And the hummers just go back and forth between the, those two flowers. Monarda is also uh, has enough nectar in it that the hummingbirds like it, as well as, of course, bees. I have found it to be a little bit more water intensive comparatively, but the blossoms are so beautiful, it's worth it. And now we have to think about those monarch larvae. As I said, there was this, this horrible weed that was just spreading through my garden was uh, taking over. I was trying to rip out, well, it was horsetail milkweed. And once, it, once I left it in place and brought in other uh, nectar rich plants, I have had monarchs. I actually have all of these, all of these different uh, milkweeds in my garden. And what's funny is even though the Asclepias tuberosa, the butterfly weed, is the showiest. There are more insects, bees, wasps, butterflies on the horsetail milkweed than anything else. It does run, so all you need is one or two plants and it will take over an area. And then one of my favorite other naturalizing plants, it's a it's technically an annual because but it self sows, so it uh, works as a perennial is a prairie coneflower. There's the Mexican hat, I, which I think refers to the the red, the the rust colored one, and then there's a yellow. They they act the same, and the finches absolutely love the seed heads. So don't cut them down. Let the finches eat them. Uh, so these are just a few of the many, many, many things that are available to us. So I know people have tons of questions challenges. So this is your time to share and uh, fire away. <laughs> awesome, Leslie. <laughs> um, we only had a couple pop up so far. I'm okay. seeing a couple more come in. So uh, the first one was, do you know that, and I think uh, uh, Mary might have answered this, do you know the website URL for which native plants can be moved without a permit and which you need uh, one four. Also, you don't need a permit either way if just moving them from one part of your property to another, correct? And how about moving from yard to a pot? Does that need a permit if a protected plant? I'm not aware of, I mean, most, most of the restrictions would be in national forest situations. And and so is, is this people who are living in the national forest? Is that what the deal is? Uh, typically, typically in terms of the way, way most things with the forest is dead, down, or detached is free. <laughs> well, it's not free. You're not, still, you're not supposed to even take them out. But in terms of moving or interacting, if it's dead, dead, or, dead down, or detached, then there's no questions. I'm not sure about moving things if you live in a national forest uh, but situation, I'm not certain. It should be fine. Yeah. What you might do is call the Highland Center for Natural History and ask. They will know. Okay. And Mary did put uh, the, eight, uh, the Arizona Native Plant Laws link in the chat right. box for anybody okay. who might want to look as well. Good. Um, okay. We had two questions from Laura. She asked, a question uh, I have is my concern with the lush look is because of 
pack rats taking cover and making nests under, underneath. Uh, any pack rat prevention strategies? They tend, um, hmm, good question. Um, if, if, if the foliage is live and flexible, um, they will tend not to collect it as much. They, if you look at their middens, they tend to be lots of sticks, lots of downed things. Um, they may eat anything. Um, uh, Especially I'm young things. I, I'm fortunate not to have a real dilemma with, with them. Uh, I have a cat and a dog <laughs> that take care of things for me. But, um, uh, you know, I have a very, I have, so I've created uh, from ground cover to upper canopy, very dense areas because I've wanted to encourage, you know, for the protection from elements as well as from predators. Um, and I have, I don't, I mean, I know certainly there are, pack rats around here, but they tend not to be in my garden. And I don't fully know why. Okay. She also wanted to know if you had any general guidelines for winter covering and shouldn't need to. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, if you're going to, if there is something that you have that is borderline, what if you cover it, co do not cover it with plastic uh, or at least not with plastic touching it. So there is um, cloth designed specifically for extending, um, uh, for, for growing, typically for extending, you know, vegetable growing, but you can use that, but, but I would also just use, um, towels and, and blankets and things and try and support them somewhat so that they, the weight isn't on the plant. Some people go so far as to put Christmas lights, like in their fruit trees, if there's, if there's a, a expected frost, They'll fill their fruit trees up with lights to try and create a little bit of warmth. The old kind of Christmas lights. Yeah. But in terms of, you know, trying, if you're buying the right, if you're selecting the right plants, you won't need to worry about. Uh, and, and it's been a short term. I've been here since 2003. And yes, there was one day I remember it being three degrees, but that was like over a decade ago. I, we haven't gotten much under 10 at my home. So it seems to be in the short term warming. Um, Corey wanted to know, she says, my flame acanthus keeps breaking branches off at the base. Any idea if it can be caused by excess water during the monsoons? It can, and that's one of, you know, it's one of those problems. Uh, I mean, I have penstemons, you know, I lost them over the winter because I had two feet of snow on them for an extended period of time. And so some things will die be because we get too much rain. Um, I'm curious, I mean, I, I have a couple of flame acanthus and I haven't had any problems with that. Is, is there any apparent chewing on, on those lower limbs or is it just breakage? Just breaking off. Just breaking off. That's bizarre. Hmm. Don't, I don't know. Um, sorry, sorry, Corey. Um, yeah. <laughs> Corey wants to know, do you recommend adding any mycorrhizal fungi to bare ground to get the native grasses to start growing again? If so, where could I get some? There's many vendors, just if you Google it, there's lots of different, uh, I used to live in California and Pleasant Valley was one of the places that, that sold that, uh, I'm not aware of it here. Um, but just, just Google. use Google well, yeah. Um, Pat asks, I have a perennial garden in front of my house. I got a note saying that I would be fine for my large weeds. What can I do to fight this? What, what um, where is this? It's in, in the front of her house in a subdivision. Pat, it, do you wanna unmute and tell us? Where is it located? Yes, I'm in Prescott Valley. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I talked to the young lady about it, and she was insistent that they were weeds. And I, evidently, she only drove by and never uh, stopped to look at them. And there is a bit of education that we have to do. And um, uh, can, will you share with me the community? I'm I'm actually a realtor, so I know 
communities? What which one is it? Uh, well, I'm up around. Um, let's see, uh, south of uh, 89A uh -huh. and Robert Road. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, you, you know, all you, all all you can say is, I mean, you can talk with the city, and they're they're actually pretty amenable. But you, you know, you just have to indicate these are native native flowers, well, native wildflowers, native plants. They are not weeds. And uh, uh, I'm caring for them, making sure they're, you know, uh, just for some it's, you know, it's more of a, it's, it's a chaotic look, which, you know, it's not as well kempt. And so for some people, it just getting them past that is, is a well, challenge. Yeah, I do have some that are non-native too, that I've spent a lot of money on. <laughs> For sure, yeah. And I've even got a peach tree in the front that's just loaded with peaches. I wonder if she thinks that's a weed, also. Oh, well, I'd hope not. Yeah. <laughs> well, and 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 all, yeah. All you do is just gently, gently educate them, and just you know, in a nice way. And and if you get any feedback from the city or something, then then you go in and they have they actually are planting many more natives. The city is there, um, so they're they're going to be understanding also even and you know they'll see well Thank she was God. from the city <laughs> she was from the city yes then, she was then um she's coming by next week again i will pull out the, about the 10 15 weeds i do have <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Hmm. you might give her a list of what the the plant names are so that she's aware yeah that's what I plan to our, our native plant database yeah, yeah. Along with the plant names, that might help. Okay. That may, yeah. yeah, that might. That's do what it. I figured I'd do. Sure. Give it Excellent. A try. Thanks, Pat. Um, <laughs> Sarah yeah. wanted to know if I am growing plants in pots in readiness to move to a new garden and water the, watering them regularly, will they become more drought tolerant as they settle into my new garden? Yes, because the soil, the the water will be held better in the soil than in a pot. Uh, pots by nature warm up the, the actual material of the pot and it helps to cause uh, evaporation. So yeah, once they're in the ground, you'll have to treat them sort of as newly planted plants though. So you have to begin the process. Just remember uh, to fully hydrate them before you actually replant them. So and when I say fully hydrate, when I use, when I plant any potted plant, I literally dunk it into a bucket underwater entirely until no bubbles come out. And I know the root ball is entirely saturated because of the soil that you dig, dig to create your hole, it's nice and loose and friable and water has lots of places to, to flow. So you want to make sure that as you learned in your master gardener class, water doesn't like to move from one strata to another, one material to another, until one is saturated. So if you have a saturated root ball and then, and then the newly uh, turned soil is saturated, there's going to be a free flow of water back and forth. So that's the most important thing. And then just water deeply, less, you know, less frequently over time. And then they'll still need their three year. Probably. Yeah, unless we get, you know, really good monsoon <laughs> continues and a really good, a good winter precipitation, you know, then sometimes it can sort of shorten up a little bit. Diane asks, when are the best time to plant natives and do plant plugs young survive better than large, larger native plant size? Every plant planted, one gallon is ideal here. Uh, because it's big enough and has enough of a root mass to get going. If you plant a one gallon next to a five gallon, the five gallon costs three or four times as more, much, is three or four times harder, takes more water per, per uh, watering. Uh, and in three years, you won't know which one was which. <laughs> so if you're patient, then you go with ones. They, because they, 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 you know, if they're the, the longer they're in the nursery, the more they're pampered. So yes, size does matter. I only start with larger ones with the foundational, the trees, and maybe if it's a, a specific 
large shrub that I want, I'll go with a five or a 15, but typically uh, one gallon. And then what the first part? Um, when's the best time to plant? Yeah, fall. 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 September. Now, the problem with the best time to plant anything, everything other than vegetables and annuals is in the fall because the plant knows the days are starting to shorten. They, they know this is a time for them to start hunkering down for the winter. So root growth continues as long as the soil temperature is 40 degrees or higher, root growth continues. The top growth slows because the plant knows it's supposed to go into a state of quiet. So fall, but the problem is, is there's less availability in the fall. The nurseries are, are structured to sell spring and all summer. And so the thing is, it's so, and, and when I say fall, September, it still may be quite warm in September, but still the plant knows it's not ready to put out a new flush of flower, flowering, which is very stressful on the plant. So if you plant in the fall, in the spring, your plant will look as though it's two years old. If you plant in the spring, it, next spring, it'll look like it's one year old. So because that root growth continues and, right. and, uh, and then it can support more top growth. Good question. We had a question. Um, I have two red yucca that didn't bloom this year. They have in the past. Any ideas why? Oh, uh, no, I mean, typically that, you know, trip, typically they interact well with those mycorrhizae. Now the thing is, is are they kind of close to a, ho a home? Close-ish? iPad, do you want to unmute? Might not be able to. Might not be. But if they've bloomed in the past, um, that's, yes, yeah, very odd that they, that they're not. It may be that they're getting too much water. Um, sometimes plants blossom because they know they have to, that's, that's their way to survive, to, 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 to move on, to get progeny going. Um, and so if, if they're overwatered, that's a possibility. Um, and I wouldn't really even be supplemental watering at all at this stage, unless we have a month of no water. Okay, Corey asks, my blue flax has lost most of their flowers and the foliage is brown slash drying. Is it normal for this time of year or is it more likely dying? Well, you have to remember what our June was. I had that same experience because June was so brutal this year. Um, uh, so yes, that is the norm. And, and they are actually annuals, but they will self-sow. I mean, and so, you know, if you want, just cut it to the ground and let the, the one right next to it that is already starting to grow uh, hide it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Nancy asks, what would be a good native ground cover that we can plant over the leech line? I like this question. Uh, something without fibrous roots, of course. You're right. Um, you know, the tr truth is you're really not supposed to plant anything um, just because you have, you have to get it established. And so you're going to be putting water on your leech line. Um, mm -hmm. So and I have septic, so I, I'm aware of this situation. Um, let's see. I mean, the truth is you could do something as simple as, okay, it's not going to be native, but it's easy peasy is, you know, oregano and thyme and, and those, because so, they spread and you, you, you don't have to hardly water at all. And you have the benefit of herbs and nobody eats them because they're too fragrant and um, so they're a really, they're a good landscape option. Um, other than that, I'm, uh, non-grass, <sighs> golly, I mean, the small grasses don't, well, if it's non-fibrous, okay, uh, I mean, the grow low sumac, it gets 18 inches high, but you don't hardly have to water it at all, it's so drought tolerant, the, um, um, I'm going through my yard in my mind, trying to come up with uh, ideas. Gosh, that's a great question. I, I like I like the creeping time. I think that might be a really nice one. 
Yeah, it would work because <laughs> it did require so little. Yeah. Nancy asks, when I'm out and see native flowers like na like Mexican hats and I collect the flower tops, what's the best way to get those started in my yard? So when you start, this is one of the kind of misconceptions people sometimes just sort of think that they can dry the seeds and then just disperse them. Well, no, because number one, there's birds. And what do they do? They eat seeds. Um, so, and you want to make sure that the soil is receptive. So typically you want to work the soil, turn it, break it up nicely. So it's fairly fine. Uh, you might add a little bit of, you know, very, very, very well composted uh, leaves and such, just to add a little bit of organic matter to help the soil retain mo enough moisture to get the seeds going and then spread them. And you can, uh, if you have seeds, you know, mix them in with sand and then you can disperse, it's a little bit easier to disperse. And besides the sand is light colored so you can see where it lands on the soil. So you know if you've hit an area or not. Um, and then and then, I had a problem, I had a situation where the jays were just, you know, they, it's like they were watching me and the toeys. And then they just, as soon as I left, they were there. And so I actually had to cover the area with uh, chicken wire just to keep, keep the uh, birds from munching. And then water, keep the soil mo moist until the true leaves emerge. So the, there's the first leaves and then the true leaves. Once the true leaves, you start uh, cutting back, not have to water daily, but start watering every other day and then go for a week or two and then every third day and then every fourth day. And once they get established, then, then theoretically, uh, if there's a monsoon and if there's winter moisture, uh, you can kind of back off the, every couple, three weeks. Right before it snows. Right. Uh, last question here. Laura asks, I've got a fairly large open area in my backyard that ends up being a weed garden. Any way to easily, affordably prevent that? Any negative concern in allowing mint as a ground cover? No, just... Um, so at, uh, are, do you live in, well, regardless, so at the Prescott Transfer Station, AKA the dump, they, you know, they uh, chip all the wood. Uh, and so what you wanna do is put a three or four inch layer of mulch over everything. Now there are perennial type weeds. So you'll have to be good about continuing to dig them out but that will take care of all the annuals. And one of the things about digging things out, you bring all the latent seeds that are underground that have not been exposed to heat or sun and they will, they will grow. But if there's a, you know, at least two, three, preferably inches of mulch, then there's no sunshine and there's not enough warmth for them to germinate. Um, and if you can't, you know, it takes a little bit of effort. It's free. That mulch is free. If you find somebody with a truck, they will actually load the trucks with a, you know, a, a tractor and, um, and just keep going back and forth. Or if you see tree people working in your neighborhood, say, I have a tarp right here. You're free to dump your chippings. And that's what I, I've, I've done an acre of my property for free by getting, getting the tree people to dump things at my place, but that will definitely stop the annual weeds from, from being exposed to enough warmth or sun and they won't germinate. She says the area is currently gravel and Laura, I had to actually get the gravel away and I did the same thing Leslie's recommending. Um, I do have to redo this with the free chips every couple years yes. because they break down. They make they do. beautiful soil. And it improves the soil. It does. And, and gravel is the best medium for seed starting because they, the seeds fall down under the gravel. They're protected, they're shaded. And yeah, so. Yeah, I yeah. get very few weeds in the bark except as it starts to thin and then we get these wonderful monsoons. Yeah. Um, I have some this year, but for the last three or four years, I've had no weeds in, in that part of the yeah. yard. Yeah. And, and, or if, if for one year you can just be assiduous and not let a single thing go to seed, 
you know, just even cut off the seed heads. Don't let any seeds drop. In about a year, you can pre pretty much have a weed-free space. And then something brings it in. And then something brings it. Yeah, and the gravel will catch it. <laughs> Leslie, this has been wonderful. We're we're about twenty or ten minutes over, so I, we really try to respect the time. And and we do have one question that um, I'm going to kind of throw my two cents on. Sure. Uh, Cheryl wanted to know when is our next monsoon madness plant sale? And because of COVID and other things, um, we have yet to be able to commit to anything like that. Um, we've been doing some renegade things within our own group, but um, we will make sure you all hear about it as soon as we can get something for the public. Uh, we will have a, a talk next month on August 25th at 6.30. Our own wonderful Jen Moreland is going to talk about rainwater harvesting. She is a phenomenal person and talk on this is going to be excellent. Um, she and I have had many, many talks. So um, I'm super looking forward to it and I wanna see you all there. So thanks for joining us again and we look forward to seeing you.